So, well, I, could, I guess I could start with uh, what, yeah, I mean, what uh, advice would you have for maybe a man who doesn't have much experience with men's circles is maybe just beginning to go like, oh, I'm noticing I'm having like repeated patterns in my life, in my relationships, maybe starting to realize, oh, my relationship with my mother or my father, it keeps becoming a, a reoccurring kind of hang up or an issue for me. Um, like I think something I, I realize we've lost is a lot of the like initiations or rites of passage like into acknowledgement to like what does it mean to be a man or becoming a man and and I'm wondering if this men's group dynamic can does hold a place for that that acknowledgement of of manhood or of um, that yeah that that bond or the, the, the knowledge or something that is shared amongst men? Well, you know, I have um, a lot of experience with a, a particular type of men's group. And so it's, it's both extensive and narrow. Um, I'm a member of a couple of men's groups, two men's groups, uh, one that uh, has been going for 16 years and the other that has been going for five. And both of those have no ideology, no real ritual. It's just about guys who enjoy hanging out with guys and talking guy talk and uh, doing guy things, but always with an idea that um, we're revealing ourselves in some significant way, not just trivia. So there are other men's groups that are sort of ritualistically based, have maybe rites of passage and so on. Um, the one that I've been in, or the, the both that I've been in, are, are much more casual. We meet every two weeks. We, we have a check-in and we're, we encourage each other to talk about what really matters rather than uh, lighter subjects. And we often do things. We go into the woods together. Sometimes we... We travel, we've gone to the desert several times in the States and um, up into the mountains of British Columbia and, um, and we do various activities in town as well sometimes. Um, go to a climbing gym or walk the seawall together. And so it's, it's primarily not for men who identify as having a problem in life, you know, they're trying to resolve major life issues. Um, our experience is just, it works well when guys just want to hang out with guys, when they notice, you know, I don't have a lot of guys in my life, or the guys that I do have in my life aren't so interested in getting emotionally close, having some deeper bond, and we can get sort of watching football games and... Um, and that's sort of the best driver of this type of group. You just want to hang out with men you know, on a regular basis and get to know them real, real well um, by meeting every two weeks, year after year. You get a profound connection with everyone in the group. And um, that's what I'm most familiar with, that type of men's group context. So you have two men's groups, one that is more like active, outdoors, interactive, and one that is more sitting and discussing? Is no, that right? no, they're both pretty much the same. In fact, this weekend coming up, we're, we're um, the second group, the shorter, the five-year group, is, is going away to the Gulf Islands for the weekend. And, and the other one, uh, I just got back from a hiking trip in Hawaii with, uh, one of the guys from that group and so both are really quite active but the core of the program of the of the group is meeting every two weeks um, to mostly share what really matters in our life. So you meet every two weeks for a few hours? Yeah usually we, we rotate hosts so every every guy hosts and there's eight in both teams so there's a guy hosting every eight weeks and one meets on a Tuesday night one meets on a Thursday night and uh, yeah we generally start around 7 7 30 and then 9 30 or 10 in there 
And this is a discussion circle, like there, like you have, is it like kind of structured, like you have time for sharing or is it just more casual? No, it's structured. It's the host's call, so it changes. Um, sometimes the host will say, um, everybody, you know, say if there's eight guys, everyone can share for four or five minutes and that runs into the 40, 45 minutes. And, uh, but if somebody has really got something going on and need to extend that, they can. And then there's often an activity uh, to talk about a specific subject, like uh, uh, what, do, what are we like in women? What, what do we find attractive in women? Uh, what was uh, a critical conversation we had growing up? Can we remember some, something that happened with a parent, a friend, uh, a stranger that really we remember for many, many years and had... Uh, effect on us. Um, sometimes we've done like art projects together sort of and, and even brought outsiders in to to lead the sessions. Um, but the dominant continuous activity is the sharing of what really matters. And you know over the years we can get to know each other really really well and sometimes just for a laugh We'll, we'll do the share for the guy on the left of us. So we know <laughs> his life so well that we can pretty much anticipate what has happened and what is really mattering. And, and it's often hilariously funny to, to see how sort of stereotyped we all are and how the same issues tend to crop up uh, year after year. And um, so both of these groups have been going for many years. Yeah. And um, are they like, is it just a, the same group of men or are there newcomers ro uh, rotating? Yeah, good question. No, they're, they're the, pretty much the same group of men. Um, we had one guy drop out after, after about five years and uh, he was replaced. And um, the other group... We had a guy actually join our team who had a fatal terminal illness, and he, he died. Um, but he was sort of late to join and, and then died. So very little turnover. Uh, we're, with eight guys, we're not really interested in expanding. And um, these are all guys who, you know, really knew what a men's group was. Most of them had had experience with a men's group before. And, and really wanted that, so knew they could make a long-term a, a commitment. What's the age range? Uh, in one group, the age range is from uh, 38 to 66, and the other group, it's from 50 to uh, 70 today. But uh, we started from, you know, 15 years ago, so we were like uh, 36 to 55 when that group started. And how were they formed? Um, yeah, it's interesting. The long, this, the 15 year group, four of us just knew each other and uh, decided to go uh, into the wilderness together. And we just had a gas. We just so enjoyed our time that we said, hey, let's keep going. So everyone invited one guy. And that made eight. And that's how the team, that team came together. And then the second team came together from one guy um, choosing nine people. And uh, one of them dropped out. But the other eight he have maintained for, as I say, five years. Hmm. Have you noticed what is... Um have you noticed the significant difference between when you're like when you're sitting and facing each other and discussing things, as, as so the kind of maybe the conversation or the freedom or the vulnerability that happens compared to when you're doing something active together, like when rather than like facing each other and talking, kind of being side by side, active in something else and talking. Do you notice much of a difference in in comfort or freedom of of speaking? Well. You know, the actions that we often do are actions where we're like hiking in the wilderness and relating. And I don't notice a whole lot of difference between that and sitting around in a circle um, relating. 
other than that, there tends to be more structure in the circle. Like when you're hiking, hey, did you see that bear over there? It can completely sidetrack any conversation and, and it will never be returned to, whereas there's more order in a, in a circle. Um, there's something to be said about sharing experiences, you know, not having a lot of talking, just, you know, climbing a mountain together can be uh, really bonding, just like sitting around talking can be. Mm -hmm. And I notice you're, it sounds like, you know, probably a pretty busy man running a couple of, or running one business, developing another, having written several books. And, um, yet you've committed for many years to going to two different uh, men's groups. Now, I wonder what, um, you know, what, what does it provide for you? Like, what is so important or significant that you have maintained such a commitment for so long? And or maybe can you share or do you have noticed any significant differences in your life before you started being part of a men's group and how being a part of one impacted you? Yeah, well, I'll say, first of all, I'm actually in a third group. So I'm a total group slut. Okay. Um, the third group is a mixed group, and um, so mixed. M women and men. Okay. So that's a, an interesting, different um, energy. Um, but it, it's quite new. It's it's been going for two years now, and it's uh, part of this new business that I'm I'm running. So it's it's a little different than um, just the men's group scene. So. Yes, men's groups have had a profound impact on my life, um, and I just can't imagine living without that. And guys I know who have had that experience and then move away from a town where they've had a men's team, often the first thing they're doing when they relocate is to find a men's team. And... Um, you know, I I was 48 when I joined the when the team started, and all my life I have had um, close relationships with guys, um, but not the ongoing continuity that a men's group provided. Like you know, I would see guys, uh, my friends, sort of maybe once every three or four weeks, and we would often get get down in a serious way. But the real sort of ongoing emotional support in my life was always one person, the woman I was with. And I got to be uncomfortable with just how much I depended on emotionally one person because I had a few of those relationships break up and I was sort of adrift. Um, uh, emotionally um, needy because this one person that I had invested so much of my emotional experience with was no longer there. And I, you know, I, I went, I've got to diversify this, this contact. And um, it's, you know, it's, complex having that degree of emotional contact with women friends. I mean, it can be done, but it's like sort of nice and easy with guys. It's, you're, you know, especially if um, they're all interested in, in connection and um, sophisticated with that. And so when I started the group and that first trip, I just went, wow, this is as juicy as talking to, you know, an intimate. This is just really amazing. And so I felt like more emotionally secure having like these close bonds with eight, seven other guys. And I felt less needy around, say, my girlfriend. And that just made the relationship healthier. If I don't need her so much, uh, I can be more independent. I can... I can be a little less anxious if things aren't going okay. And all of that just makes the relationship better. So, um, and also it, it like having regular training, like one of the neat things about um, an emotional, uh, an immense team is that it, it requires you to sort of go inward a fair, fair amount. Like what is really going on? Like I don't, you know, we don't really want to hear about your attitudes to the Canucks 
or um, you know the environmental catastrophe. I mean, those could be important subjects, but what we're really here for is like, what really is going on inside? Let's let's open up and see. And um, that actually is good training for when you come to be in a really intimate relationship, like like being with a woman. Is you've had some practice looking inside and uh, figuring out what you feel about things and you can bring that I'll call it expertise to a relationship with a woman so there's another um, advantage to it I mean I say all this of course saying man and woman I'm a straight guy and actually everyone in our teams are all straight but I'm sure the thing thing would apply if if I was gay and 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 had uh, a, a guy friend rather than a girlfriend. Right. Um, and so you said you're also in a group that has men and women. What's the basis of that group? Is it this kind of the same principle, just to be... It's a little different. Um, I, my last book is called um, Joy Shift, The Journey to Primal Happiness, and it's a, it's a study of uh, happiness and... Um, the deep roots in our genes of what causes us to be happy. And um, so this group is, consists of people who are interested in learning about that and doing some of the practices. So the men's teams have no sort of book behind them or anything like that, whereas I call it the joy team. We're working through the book and doing the exercises. We still have a check-in because a component of joy is getting down um, and having an emotionally, I mean, basically, uh, one of the, the core ideas of the book is that what makes us happy today is what uh, helped our ancestors survive. So for hundreds of thousands of years, we were running around as hunter-gatherers. Only very, very recently have we been out of that environment. And our, our emotional lives evolved to like the things that helped us survive. If, it might not be totally obvious, but if you think about it, if, if that it was, it was provided a, a survival advantage if you liked to connect with other people. And connection was absolutely essential for survival your chances of success of surviving were higher. So the genes that cause you to like groups would tend to replicate. And so that's the core idea of primal happiness, that what makes us happy today is what was central to survival hundreds of thousands of years ago. And one of the interesting things about life then was that we lived in small intimate bands, 20 to 40 people, 24-7. We absolutely depended on each other for survival. You could last three, maybe four days alone in the wilderness. Sometimes you'd have to cross on your own to visit family and, and do uh, um, scouting and things. But generally, unless you were supported by a tribe, you were dead meat. And so a deep need, I believe, is for us to have a sense of connection with a small number of deeply known people. And so that's part of the joy team is getting that connection. And in our modern culture, it's very, very difficult to, to find that group connection. We can get one-on-ones, you know, a fair amount of one-on-one -on -one friends, and we can have our families. But there's not a lot of institutional structure to get really connected in a small group. And that's what a men's group provides, and that's what the joy team concept provides as well. Do you notice much difference in your comfort to, to share openly or be vulnerable when it's just men as opposed to when there's women mixed in the group? Um, yes, but really only in one area, and it's the area of... Um, men women relations there is a, a one of the wonderful things about men's groups is that men share a genetic disposition around women um, and um, like for example we have 10 times on average the testosterone of women 
So there's, there's, a, there's a way that, by which men relate to women. And often there's anxiety about that. And if you're with conscious men, that noble, I believe, part of a man can be validated. And it's often men are frightened of it. They're afraid that it's disrespectful to women or uh, that women won't understand them, that they don't have the ability to really describe exactly what they're feeling about women and about sexual experience. So there's more caution talking about sexuality and gender relations in a mixed group than in a men's group, I've found. And that's one of the juiciest parts of men's groups uh, that I've experienced is when, when we talk about our relationships with women and when we can really open up about this area, it's often like everyone's in a little shell about it. And to be able to talk to men openly about sexuality and relationship and not be judged or laughed at um, is really important. And um, I'm sad for the, the men who don't have that resource. What, uh, what makes a good host? For a men's group, um, that's a really great question. I think, first of all, um, real responsibility, like taking the hosting um, job seriously. Um, so remembering that they are hosting. Um, if this is a rotation, if it's obviously, if it's, a, if it's a team where it's hosted by one person, then that's another model for teams that I don't have really any experience of. But um, when it's rotating, really, really making a note, I'm hosting to, on Tuesday or Thursday and putting some thought into an exercise. What could we do that's creative? And, uh, you know, um, maybe doing a little research about it. And, you know, we had one a few weeks ago where we started tracking our time. And the host did a lot of research about ways to do that with all the modern tools. It's incredible um, and very rewarding for people. Or another time it was just a really practical one on does everyone have a grab and go bag? You know, if the big earthquake comes, uh, you're not going to have time to pack. You literally got to run out the door with a bag with the necessities. And so there was like a show and tell this guy what was in his bag. And so putting a little thought into um, the content of the meeting is to me what really makes for a great host. But isn't it also about sensing what's going on in the conversation and picking up on things and and asking the group to f focus on a certain subject and somehow juggling the topics throughout the, the meeting um, and well gain I mean it usually in our teams that role is pretty mild we're all pretty self um, hey you know you've you're rambling on or I the time has expired or hey the, you don't remember you shared exactly the same thing last week um, we don't give a big responsibility to the host except to announce it so we have several days to think about it and to you know have treats available um, when we come and to uh, come up with a uh, an activity, but in terms of sort of sensing the mood of the room and policing that, that tends to be a group, a group activity. And that's one of our themes is to try to get the group involved as much rather than let a few dominant leaders take, take control. It's nice to have just everybody sort of acting as, as host in that micro way of it, actually within the meeting. What makes uh, men's groups fail? I don't know. I haven't been in one that fail, has failed. Commitment. 
yeah, I just, I, um, yeah, I, I, you'd have to talk to people in groups who have failed because mine have uh, not. So I just don't know. I, I've heard of groups that fail, but um, I wasn't part of them to know really what undermined it. So I'm not, a, it's not a good, I, I don't have expertise on that. Okay, uh, maybe not a group that fills, but there must have been meetings that kind of didn't have that juice that you talk about. What happened there? Well, okay, if you're talking about what makes a good uh, meeting, um, I think that it is uh, disclosing feelings more than talking about events. Um, It's amazing how habitual it is to be shallow in our conversations. Um, we don't have a lot of structure in our life that encourages really talking about what matters. And we don't even have a lot of structure about identifying what it is that really matters. People are often asked, what are you feeling? And they don't know. They're, they're, the whole inner life is foreign to most of us because we spend so much of our time sort of taking care of business, taking care of the family, going through the daily uh, rush that really taking time to get to know what's going on inside is, is often not done. And so... Um, Even in men's groups, even in our men's groups, which are highly conscious men who've had years and years of experience getting intimate, often we need uh, reminders, you know, can we, can we hear how that made you feel? Like what, we're not getting a read on what's, what's really going on with you. And so... The more people in a group that are prepared to play that role and the more the group is constituted around encouraging an exploration of the inner world rather than so much the outer world, um, the more juicy a meeting is. Mm. Have you had to deal with um, serious conflicts inside the group? No, we have had a few cases where um, men were uh, conflicted um, outside the group and uh, had to resolve those and they were successfully resolved. And that's one really great thing about a team is you can have a container that maintain safety and basic rules uh, for communication. And so you can process issues that could have arised in the group or outside the group. Um, and in our case, you know, some fairly major differences were overcome and the guys are, uh, you know, went from not speaking each to each other to, you know, normal members of the group. Let's have a closer look at this concept of safety. Obviously, we're talking about emotional safety. The, the physical safety is, is probably given, right? Yeah. But... Well, things like, first of all, can you trust that the people who are hearing your most intimate um, disclosures, are, is that going to stay in the group? Or is that going to leak out to the wives? The, the wives are, you know, a real danger point and girlfriends. Is, and uh, confidentiality is a critical one and often difficult because, um, you know, what's said in the group is, is obviously confidential. But the problem is, is that if you're also independent friends with various members of the group, it's hard to track what was stated inside the group and what was stated as a public fact outside the group and, and not confidential in any way. So we've had a few little uh, run-ins there. But uh, so confidentiality is, is really trusting that everyone 
And that's where mutual disclosure becomes so important. If, you know, if we're all disclosing to a deep degree, then we're all really interested in maintaining confidentiality. But um, somebody who's hanging back doesn't necessarily have the same interest because they haven't really revealed. And so a breach of confidentiality isn't going to hurt them like it would somebody who's you know, and there's often really intense stuff in confidentiality. People, if you breach confidentiality, it could cause the loss of literally millions of dollars. They're in a, a battle in their business with somebody. And, and you know, you have to have ironclad confidence that what you're stating is, is, uh, is, is confident. Um, and I think reciprocality is really, really important. So... Uh, back to what I mentioned before, if if one guy is perpetually not really coming forth, it it's harder to trust him. Um, so it constantly encourage everyone to dig deep and and talk about you know what is going on is is uh, uh, good for um, uh, safety as well as juiciness. Have you personally selected men to join the group, to invite to join the group? Or were you part of that? In, in one, the, the second group that I mentioned, the, the newer group, the, all the members were selected by one guy. And uh, he's got a huge social network and he selected them because he knew that these guys are all experienced men's groupers and for one reason or another weren't in a men's group right now. Um, and in the other group, it was, we, we all just selected one guy, one, one person we knew, and it made eight, which is what we wanted. What type of criteria are there for, how, how do you choose yeah, the right men? That's a really good question because, um, If groups are going to fail, I imagine one reason is just because the men are either not really interested in that deep disclosure or just don't know how to do it. So things like, uh, first of all, has the guy had men's group experience? So that just says a ton right there. If he's being a member of a men's group and, you know, he's, he's like, left one behind because he moved from Toronto to Vancouver or something, then that's almost an automatic in. But if he hasn't had that background, has he done like any therapy? Has he ever gone to workshops? Has he, has he got any sort of practice such as meditation or yoga where focusing on the insides is, is uh, you know, intrinsic to the practice? Um, You know, in one of our groups, where none of us are employees. We all own our own businesses. And we found that sort of interesting when it struck us. That, um, and, you know, that was bonding because we all, you know, understood uh, the ups and downs of being a business person. Uh, but, it may, you know, I know lots of groups that are a mix of, you know, long-term employees and, um, and business people, so... I don't know how important that is. Um, I think age diversity is fantastic. Um, nice to have younger and older men in uh, a group. Um, roughly, you know, if you're going to be physical, um, uh, physical fitness, you know, some some people are just aren't physically fit, so. It's sort of a drag that they couldn't come and share like an outdoor activity that might require some level of physical fitness. Um, you know, this is, this is, um, I'm not 100% confident about what I'm to say. I'm sort of thinking um, just as I go here, but There's something about um, having an alternative worldview or, you know, sort of questioning society that I think is more likely to attract people to men's groups because it is sort of counter 
normal, like being in a men's group is, is quite unusual and it, it has these issues that's already been raised. It's almost like, is there maybe a stigma associated or is, are, they, are they sort of needy men that, you know, or aren't real men or some weird associations with men's groups? And um, I, I think an alternative, all the guys in my men's team sort of have are are in some way not adopting the standard party line of high consumption and uh, you know mass activities. They're sort of independent, think for themselves, breaking out of the mainstream mold in many different ways. And the men's group is just one more way. And so, you know, I think some basic communality like that could really um, be effective as opposed to people who were, you know, in a, I don't know, who just bought into the social norm. But again, those guys tend not to be interested in men's groups. So I'm not sure what I'm saying. Well, it, it might be... Uh to invite someone like that might be actually a good idea, I think, because if you find someone who's eloquent and who's interested in, in, in the right subjects, then perhaps he can, uh, he can bring lessons that we cannot find in any other way. That's true. Diversity is, you know, a good thing generally. What, what is the value for the older men to have younger men present? Oh, just, first of all, there's energy, there's enthusiasm, there's a whole culture, you know, massive culture is age dependent and there are really interesting things going on in younger culture that I've been exposed to through the 30-something guys in, in the newer team. Um, and yeah. It's, it's fascinating, a lot to do with tech and um, different sort of subcultures within the youth culture. And um, society is stratified on age to some degree. So to have cross-fertilization from juniors to seniors and seniors to juniors is, is really good. And we have the, that... You know, it's in one team, it's a 28-year-old, 28-year span between the youngest and oldest, and in the others, it's, it's 20. And that's almost a generation. So it's good, good to have an age diversity. Can you identify certain phases in your long-term groups, like does something change after 10 years? Is there, because I'm, I'm in a new group now, and I mean, what is the life of a, of a men's group? If, if I'm in, in, in the children's phase, you know, yeah. what happens in the adolescence phase, in the adult phase? In the well, I think there, as a, as a group, ages, I think there is an increasing challenge to keep it vital. It's sort of like a marriage. As a marriage gets longer and longer in the tooth, um, to make it interesting and even exciting requires real effort. It's not by default interesting and exciting the way a new relationship is. You don't have to work at a new relationship to be interesting and exciting because you're constantly learning new things about the partner. But if you spent a lot of years like we have and can basically share for somebody else, it can get uh, a little dull. And um, so it requires greater effort to uh, make the, the sessions more interesting. And um, you know, the host and others really stepping up to the plate to, to um, ensure that it just doesn't 
get into talking about events and um, maybe to have less time sharing and more time about activities or um, projects to do in the evening together. Um, so that is a challenge. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the main one. It's also just a very practical one for our our uh, older group. We're running out of really amazing places that are close at hand to go to into the wilderness. We're just having to go, okay, do we go back to the same places? And, um, you know, maybe that's not a big deal, but um, we're also aging. That's, that's an interesting thing. So, you know, when I was 48 and, you know, the youngest guy was 36, um, we could all slug a pack sack on and not think anything about it. But now, you know, half of the team or more is in their 60s. And, you know, really adventurous trips that we wouldn't give second thought to now it's do we want to do it at all and there has been a gradual decline in the adventuresomeness of our of our wilderness activities which I um, disappoints me because going into the wilderness with the group is like just about the the most spectacular experience of my life other than you know being with my girlfriend it's it's just absolutely incredible to roam around beautiful um, waterways or up on the Alpine. I mean, just totally peak experiences in my life, and I I don't want them to end. But I you know I see as we're all aging, <laughs> there's going to be a day when we just you just can't do that anymore. So, what advice? Or have you noticed, perhaps, maybe through other men, uh, relationships with other men in your life who aren't involved in men's circles, have you noticed a maybe a, a difference in how they cope with crisis or with relationships? Like maybe you've had an experience with men who, who choose not to kind of... Uh, be vulnerable or open themselves or have those conversations more, you know, the kind of men who are very like maybe protective and more competitive and, um, yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, I've noticed this several times, um, that men who are in men's groups have practice in, um, talking to a small group. And I've noticed in small group sessions, um, with men who haven't been in men's groups, either as part of business um, meetings that I've been part of or casual social meetings, that there is um, a subtle sense of um, what I regard as sort of inappropriate, like going on too long, like not being sensitive to there's an audience and and like sort of I hogging the floor, which you might do early stage of men's groups, and then you know you're gently pointed out through jokes and things that you know you go on longer than anyone else, and then it's oh okay. Um, so there there's something really interesting about men regulating each other in a group. So a lot of men are um, full of themselves, I guess I would put this, that especially sort of entrepreneurial business oriented men, they see themselves as special. They often are in their workplace, um, in their family, because they're earning the money, they might have a dominant position. And so they don't have a lot of experience just being like one of the guys. And when they get into groups, they can naturally move into that position of dominance, which often just isn't appropriate. And so there's something I've noticed with men in men's groups that they, they tend to be less full of themselves. Um, at, at least in sort of interactions with other people. And I, 
I have that sense that it's really good for, for guys to be in because, you know, if you're like a wallflower that doesn't say much, that isn't particularly encouraged in a group. Like, you know, we don't want you just hanging out. I mean, show up or take off, you know, like participate. So that's good for people who might, you know, have a shyer tendency. And the opposite, you know, we don't want any, like, you know, alpha males running around here. Like, go do that in your business maybe. But this is, this is a, a gathering of, of equals, a guy, guys who are really, like, respecting each other and expecting, respecting boundaries and, like, just even airtime boundaries, you know. And so there is that that I that I that I have noticed. Um, in terms of crises, um, there is no question. You know, somebody's in help. Bang, the word. Uh, somebody's in in crisis. The word goes out. He needs help, and there's a crew ready to to um, you know clean his home or buy his groceries or it's like a basic backup that. Um, and it's, it's a little different, like most of us have like friends that we can do that with, but often those friends aren't connected. Like, you know, somebody can be in a crisis and tell friend A and tell friend B. It would sure help if A and B could coordinate and not have to have the person who's in need having to do all. Whereas when there's a group of people, they already have the network set up to communicate, okay, who's going to take breakfast, who's going to take like that, and so you don't get three guys showing up with breakfast. And um, so there's real practical um, crisis management stuff that, that, that matters. Um, just more, more people to share it with, like... You know, you can process it with more people and because often what men's groups do is you get close to the guys in your men's team and, and it's not just you see them in men's team. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly having uh, coffee or wine or walks with guys in my teams. So you're going through a crisis, you can get down on a one-on-one -on -one as well with more people. So in either of your groups, uh, how, I guess I would say, how bold or how comfortable are you guys with being like very direct? Maybe when you see a man stuck with something or like uh, having an issue in his life and, and you, you kind of see some advice you'd like to offer him, like are you more respectful and just kind of let him get his own lesson or do you, or can, is there a comfort to be very direct and challenging? Well, every group has different uh, culture around that. In, in some groups, it's um, not okay to offer any, even to ask, do you want some advice? But in our groups, it's if somebody wants to uh, offer something, they ask. I, 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 uh, and, and you're free to say, you don't know, no, I, I don't want any questions. I, I just did my share and... Uh, so it, it's always the person who is the subject of the discussion is in the driver's seat. It's not confrontative in any way. I've heard that in, in other groups um, it can be very confrontative, but in ours it's, we do welcome feedback. And I'd say 90% of the time if somebody says, can I give you some ideas or would you like to hear my take or can I ask you some questions? I'd say 90% of the time the subject says, sure, fire. So would you say, I guess maybe the, uh, the group is, is mature enough to not get caught on that, that fix it, their problem solving tendency that a lot of men have to feel like they, they know the solution and they want to get in there. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I don't think the Mr. Fix-It really works that well um, because the most important prerequisite to Mr. Fix-It is being heard. Was the person heard? And often the Mr. Fix-It can go quickly into solution and not really have attended to, the, to, to listening. So a culture of really listening is 
is good. And um, but you can get both best of both worlds just by um, asking f to give advice or feedback or a suggestion, and not just volunteering it. Did you did you set any ground rules about that? Yes, that absolutely confidentiality and you know not interrupting um, and telling the truth and not offering advice uh, without first getting permission to do so are the core principles. Mm. And what would you say are some like essential maybe characteristics or, or values that are kind of required to be a part of like a, a long-term men's team like that? Well, I mean, the core thing is you have to value um, deep contact and lots of people just don't value that that's we, we got to you know be open about that that in our culture it's it's a I believe it's a pretty superficial culture people spend a lot of time not really sharing what's really going on with them and as I said before because often they don't even know themselves so um, when it comes to simply doing some external activity um, which doesn't require them to look in like you know being on social media or watching television or going to movies or concerts or externally oriented things that will attract them much more than you know spending like two and a half hours getting down with guys it's like so it's it's actually pretty unusual. I figure there's one in a, in five hundred men, maybe one in a thousand, who really is genuinely interested in that, and that's the core criteria. People, if they don't have that, they're not going to join. And and if they join just as a lark to see what it's about, um, they're not going to stay. And so the question is, who really wants to connect at a deep level? Is the type of person that is most likely going to enjoy a men's group and, and spend time in it. So you said in uh, one of the groups you you realized you were all um, entrepreneurs or yeah. self-employed. Yeah. So I guess you would say one characteristic is kind of that, that self-motivation that and maybe a bit of leadership. And so is there something about maybe the kind of men that, that can sustain being in a men's circle really have that... I guess that that yearning for for knowing themselves better, for challenging themselves, or for their their kind of being the best they can be, rather than just getting by. It's a, it's an interesting thought. Um, is there a relationship between the sort of self-employed uh, people or men and people who join men's groups? I don't know. I mean, I there are people who are in employee jobs who, in in one of the groups, and uh, I know other groups that are dominated by guys in employee type jobs, and uh, they're just as into it. So I would more say it might not depend on the type of work you do and more just on your personal interest in in the inner world okay so aside from uh, maybe the that that willingness as you said is, is kind of rare um, and that willingness to to how did you put it to go deep or to yeah to to really disclose what's going on with you right and to be interested in similar disclosures from others Okay, so aside from that, is there any other commonalities uh, amongst the men in these groups that you've noticed that stand out for you? Um, that's a good question. Um, as I mentioned before, but it might be the same issue what you, as what you've just said, there's, there's an alternativism. These are people who tend to question, you know, a lot of aspects of mainstream culture. They don't eat a normal diet, not, you know, heavy on meat and potatoes. There tends to be more um, experimentation with their diet. Um, 
they tend to be, you know, not mainstream travelers. They tend not to go to all inclusives, but do an independent traveling thing um, in different parts of the world. Um, they tend to have not conventional relationships with women generally. They'll be a little more, you know, they've been married once or twice before the current relationship they're in, or um, you know, not tend not to be people who have been married for 30 years, grown kids. I mean, not to say that's unknown, but just, just there tends to be a correlation with alternativism, um, a little bit of non-mainstreaming. Um, often, another thing is they, you know, and I'm an exemplar of that too, but I'd say I, a lot of, maybe every one of the guys is, is there, they've, they've done different things in their life. They've had two or three careers or lived in different cities and, you know, just, just have led, not like they went to high school in the suburbs and never left and, you know, married their childhood sweetheart and worked for the school board for 40 years. Uh, that tends not to be the profile of the groups that I've seen. Um, what advice would you have for a, say, a, a young man in his, in his mid to late twenties, like just trying to figure out what it, what it means to be a man or how to, how to, how to ground himself, how to be confident in the world. Like, uh, like imagine if you had a son, you know, around that age, like what would be maybe some of just the, yeah, the, the best advice? Well, I would say, um, get your ass out of your hometown and go see the world. Um, and that's something that I did uh, for a couple of years in my mid-twenties and had a profound impact on me. I spent a year in, in India mostly and a uh, good part of a year in Europe when, and just traveling around, seeing a whole range of different lifestyles and, and having to deal with privation. You know, everything isn't super comfortable and... Um, and so really important, I think, to get out of institutions and have to be on your own, think on your feet. Uh, I just, it should be, you know, like uh, sort of the equivalent of a year of university or something. If you haven't done it, you need to get it before you can graduate. Um, so that would be the first thing. Uh, I definitely would encourage men to join a men's team. I just, the younger you, you join it, um, the better the payoff, the faster the payoff is going to come. I regret that I was, you know, lived uh, more than half my life, probably 48, um, without, without being in a men's team. It's had such a huge impact on my life that... Uh, I sure wish I'd, I'd uh, had experience with it in my 20s. Um, I you know, just did, you probably gathered from me, and it's, it's just my thing. You know, I, I really, I don't think our culture is that healthy. Um, I, you know, I don't think a lot of people really thinking people would disagree. We're, we're killing the world slowly. And... Something is really wrong with the way uh, the world is happening in, in the modern era. And so thinking critically is, you know, really questioning the dominant uh, institutions um, is, I think, really important and probably going to bring you more happiness than just following the conventional mainstream wisdom. I mean, I could, I've written a whole book on <laughs> how to be happy, so I could go on and on about that. It isn't really age-based, and again, I think that the younger a person understands the deep roots of happiness, the more likely they're going to have a happy life than me who discovered them in, you know, my 50s. Uh, but, but in terms of just a young man finding a man his manhood, it would be a lot about just get out of institutions and get on your own um, traveling.
is the best education I know to really develop um, maturity and self-confidence. Well, I imagine in your books you've probably explored like um, sort of purpose or like kind of meaning or direction of life. Purpose is a critical so coming back to the idea of these primal, I call them primal nutrients, the things that our ancestors needed to survive and which our genes are all biased in favor of, like a small group connection, like lots of movement. Our, our ancestors were nomads. So I call these things that were biologically conditioned to enjoy the primal nutrients of happiness. and. So um, uh, one of them is purpose, and I, you know, I could. You needed to. You needed to have a strong sense of purpose to survive as a hunter gatherer, and I, I won't go into that because that's off topic. But yes, I think, I think finding purpose, finding something that you can dedicate yourself to, and invest in, is a critical ingredient of happiness. And, you know, today we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of the publication of um, a book that's widely recognized as one of the most influential of all time, in the modern era anyway, called the, um, the, uh, uh, Victor Frankl, The Search to Man's, Man's Search Meaning. for Meaning. Sorry, yeah. it escaped my moment. Thank you. Man's Search for Meaning. And in that he showed that you know, having a real dedication to a purpose can even make a concentration camp bearable. Um, and that's, I believe, because by nature, we, our, our bodies want to have something that we're dedicating to and slowly moving towards. So, yeah, like really taking time to find what really turns you on is an important, and knowing that that can change. You know, over my life, I've had many different passions, mostly reflected in my books. And I wrote books about what I was passionate about, and those subjects are very different subjects. And I, find, I found that writing a book helped give me purpose by, instead of like, for example, one of my books was a, a guide to tr sea kayaking up and down the coast of British Columbia. And originally I started it as just a fun thing to do. And then I realized there was a, uh, I was right at the beginning of a huge new sport. Um, and there was a need for a guidebook and I could actually make money doing it. And by actually taking on that project as a formal project more than just going on my own casual trips, I got way more out of the trips. I started researching the areas I was going to. I found whoa, you know, like really interesting First Nation sites that I would have completely missed because they were up in Inlet and around the corner. But having done research, contacting Native bands, all the rest, I found a huge amount of stuff that I never would have found had I made it more casual. And it enriched the experience. Um, so that was sort of one way I found out when I was a young man. And I, it sounds like you're doing something similar because here you're you know, you're not quite sure what the concept is, you know you need some interviews and you're formalizing it and recording it and this would be a good thing. I'd say you're on to that yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think maybe a lot of, a lot of people uh, equate purpose with like career. Um, but I wonder what, um, yeah, I mean, what, what, what guidance or even definitive uh, information would you have about about like finding something purposeful like something to i mean i think you know especially you know maybe for for talented or intelligent people like there there seems to be a lot of options and and it's like i think i struggle with that sometimes spreading myself too thin and and so i wonder you know what advice do you have for for how to how to choose how to discern like what is something really significant for you to you know, I'm probably not the best person to answer that because uh, it's always been pretty clear what my next gig is, um, with some big interruptions. Um, I knew that when I was 12 years old that I wanted to become a lawyer. 
So I went sailing through school, um, knowing that's exactly, I, I saved a year because I knew I wanted to get into law school and I was able to, to do that without getting a, a preliminary degree before going into law school. And, um, and then I graduated and, uh, you know, I, I went, really? You know, I, the lawyers I knew now that I'd graduated seemed to be really not enjoying their job. And uh, I went, God, do I want to do this? And so after investing, you know, a huge part of my life to become a lawyer, I dropped the whole thing and went to India. And that was so fantastic because I came back with a whole new perspective on what I wanted to be as a lawyer. I, I, I knew I wanted to come back as a lawyer, but not the corporate lawyer that, the track I was on. Um, and basically working for big corporations and making lots of money and just maintaining this messed up system. No, I knew I wanted to be an alternative lawyer and represent environmental groups and human rights groups and, you know, sort of use my skills to make a difference in the world. And it was, you know, I had to take a year out to really get clear what it was I wanted. And, and then when I got into law, I found a specialty that absolutely turned me on and um, didn't take, you know, then that even trumped my law career because I got so interested in the subject, which is the politics of sexuality, the, the social politics of sexuality, not just the interpersonal politics, that I ended up dropping law to write a book on the subject and then morphed into a whole new career uh, around human sexuality. So um, I'm perhaps unusual in um, finding lots of subjects and going, ooh, that's really juicy let's invest in it and yet they all come to an end you know after the kayaking lasted for five six years of intensive kayaking and then I sort of felt the book was published and I felt done now I go kayaking occasionally but it isn't anything like it once was um, so uh, I don't I'm not a great guy to ask like how do you really find your passion um, other than experiment a lot. That's what I've done. The book is called The Politics of Lust. And amazingly, it's pretty much the only book on what I regard as a spectacularly important subject, which is how our deep tissue attitudes towards sexuality are formed. And I saw that there was negative attitudes to sexuality in the law. I confronted this as part of my human rights work. And I saw that judges who are normally the most articulate people you could possibly imagine um, started to speak vaguely and very unjudge-like when it came to sexuality. It's almost like they couldn't think clearly about what they we're talking about. And th this provoked a real, a very small study, what, what's going on with that? And then I discovered that this question hadn't been studied in the law. I thought there were all sorts of answers that other academics and people would have looked at it. No, I was pretty much on my own. And then you know, I started to look at, well, why don't schools really have comprehensive sex education programs? And why are there rules like it's okay to take children to a mixed martial arts where they can beat men, can beat each other up and bleed and kick each other in the face and, you know, terrific violence. And yet, the thought of children observing a lovemaking act would be just horrifying to people. Like, what's that about? Why would a normal human act of love be, provoke such anxiety where vicious violence is something we'd celebrate? And I was shocked to see how little those questions had been asked, let alone answered. And so started to engage in a very intensive study that took me like, you know, basically full-time research. I had a very lucrative 
legal gig that allowed me to make a living um, in a fairly n sh small number of hours a week um, and then devoted all my my time to this to writing researching traveling the world interviewing people and it ended up in this book called the politics of lust and it concluded with the, a very I won't go into it but a, a really to me fascinating idea which is that the deep cause of sexual anxiety, like what I've talked about, the, the, when people are uptight about talking about sexuality, um, when they're ashamed about their normal sexual desires, when judges can't think clearly, that what's called sexual anxiety is ultimately the product of hierarchical social relations. So the more hierarchic culture you've lived in, whether it be an authoritarian father or you, you were in an army or a cop or you're in a fundamentalist religion where relationships tend to be dominance and submission based, you will be anxious about sex more than somebody who's brought up in a very egalitarian family. The mother and father are equal. The kids are not beaten. They, uh, they live maybe in an artist colony, which is completely relaxed around uh, nudity and sexuality. They have a religion, which is, you know, not a big jealous father God and on and on. There's this fascinating correlation between equality and sexual comfort and domination and sexual anxiety. And that's what the book is about. And you might get a a sense of the complexity of it just you know and how long it took me to, to get to the bottom it felt like I was you know uncovering imagine um, imagine an airplane buried in the desert and you dust you see just the, the, the tail and you wonder what the hell is this and it takes you years to looks like something you know vertical and and then another five years to discover it's got a fuselage and three years later to discover it's got, and then oh my god this looks like a bird I think it's a flying you know that's how it was with me sort of really starting with very specific issue of a judge not being uncharacteristically not being able to explain him or herself when it came to sexuality all the way to you know why religions are so anti-sexual well, they're antisexual because they're hierarchical and the non-hierarchic religions are very sex positive and on and on. I saw this parallel come out over and over again and anyway, that's that short story there. That led me to opening a store in Vancouver and giving seminars like one that's coming up in a couple of weeks called Let's, Let's Talk About Sex which is aimed at, at helping people get over, you know, their sexual muteness. It turns out that most people can't openly talk with even their lover about sex, let alone anyone else. So um, I became sort of an activist in sex positive area. Do you bring that into the men's discussions often or do you find there's a, a, a desire or a need for that subject? Well, yeah, I mean, our I can't speak for, for my groups, but I'd say that when we talk about sex, we're all right there. We're, it's, it's probably our favorite subject, um, talking about sexuality, because it, it is a forum where it's totally safe. Like we reveal pretty intimate aspects about our own sexuality to, to our partners, uh, I mean our our partners in the men's group and there are sometimes issues when we have partners it's there you know partners can say like you know these things I don't want revealed to the men's group because they involve me you can talk about you but I don't want you to talk about me and other other partners don't have the same rule but yes if we we it's a, a format where you can really get inside the heads of other men and their sexuality and that's fascinating to have that degree of openness and uh, I'd say it's a favorite topic. I'd guess I'd be interested to hear Tristan's view on this of, of what is the most favorite topic around to discuss in a men's group. Hmm. Here's just one more question on that vein. Would you say um, that having that openness to discuss, to talk about sex in a group of men helps you really, I guess, get to know or get comfortable with your own sexuality a lot more. 
or would it might it create some insecurity as then you're, you're you're knowing about other men and like maybe start developing some comparisons um I mean, I guess it's probably pros and cons to each, but as opposed to, you know, many men who may not have that, that comfort and may not talk about it openly, never only know their own, own kind of world of sex and, and don't, aren't comfortable, maybe, you know, in a, in a very religious uh, background or something, aren't comfortable discussing it with other men, like, would you say that that openness to discussing it in a group really informs your own sexuality? Two things. First of all, one of the wonderful um, side effects of any form of self-disclosure is you learn about yourself. When you start opening up to others, you start hearing yourself say things that you weren't so clear about. So, so yes, when you talk about sex, about your own sexuality, you learn about yourself. Um, I don't, I've, I don't experience anything like um, jealousy or uh, intimidation from hearing other people's talk. I think because sex is so hidden, um, there are like absurd stereotypes of what's common. And so having a reality check by hearing the way other real men are sexual in their lives is more like an antidote to the fantasy life that is more likely that men are going to compare themselves to than real men in their life. Is there a danger to intellectualize things too much in a men's group? I don't know what you mean. Give me an example. I wish I had good examples. The issue is that I hear so many other men talk about this, that it becomes too fragmented, maybe. Um, that it, too mechanical. You know, maybe they want to look at things more abstractly, uh, spiritually, perhaps. Well, yeah, I mean, that, okay, so, if people are talking about thoughts, I think that God is this or that my spirituality is that. Th those are ideas. And there is a place for ideas in a men's team. But generally speaking, you can express ideas fairly openly in less intimate domains. Um, there are meetup groups on spirituality and on cooking or politics. And um, it's, it's important to have a rough idea of what people think about politics and spirituality as men's team uh, members, but it's wasting precious time if that is a lot more of that than there is I'm really anxious about my mother's illness. I'm uh, really horny and I've got the hottest girlfriend that I just met and oh my god I haven't felt this way since I was 22. Um, I'm so excited. I'm gonna. I, I, I think I'm gonna land a big deal. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get a major contract. Um, you know, I'm lonely. I'm fucking lonely. I, I just put my cards. These are more appropriate, it seems to me, for a men's team, for any sort of intimacy group. Than, than sort of the ideological. And, um, and I, th I think the best men's groups and the ones that are longest recognize that. And because, you know, I might not be interested in politics or your politics or uh, environmental issues, so, but I'm always interested in what my brother is feeling. That always strikes me as really interesting. 
So I think the antidote to intellectualization is to have guys in the team recognizing that and then saying, you know, depending on the culture, some will require that you ask permission to ask a question. Others, no, you can, after the end of the share, what are you feeling about that? You've just talked about this contract and how Joe was doing that and and Ed was com coming to get you and, you know, and you thought he was trying to cheat you in a way, but like, okay, great, those are all facts and figures. How do you actually feel about it? What was going on? That's way more juicy. I don't really care about Ed and his Machiavellian ways. <clears throat> I'm really interested in your your internal world. And the more the more guys that can sort of herd us all into talking about our feelings, the juicier it gets. Do you do you guys examine the concept of masculinity itself? No. That's, no, I don't think we've ever really talked about uh, that. It's, no, I, I, I can't remember. Certainly, my, you know, in 16 years, I, I, what am I saying? We must have touched on it, but it isn't, um, gender roles is not a big discussion in our group. We... You know, I know there are some groups that have a real thing about what a man is and what a woman is. Uh, I personally don't buy that. I think it's it's um, a, a diversion and um, just showing up as who you actually are is more important than figuring out is this what a man does or a woman does. The subject itself... Um... Do you have aversion to topics like that? To who? To topics like uh, examining masculinity. Well, it, it's just, if it's going to take us all into the intellectual realm and debate ideas, it's in the same order of, um, you know, who should we vote for, which we'll have those conversations occasionally, but it won't be the whole team because, you know, you can read discourse on that in the newspaper. And, and similarly, there are entire books on the nature of gender identity and gender roles. And, but there aren't any books on what Tristan or John is feeling and really in their, in their soul today. And so that's more making use of the special format we've come into and Tristan and John don't really feel comfortable sharing that like to newspapers and everyone else where we might talk about political ideas to newspapers. So I don't have any aversion to the subject of gender or politics or any other thing but I want to limit it because it can just get us into the ideological realm and it's juicier to stay into the subjective personal realm. But there is a reason why you are in a men's group, or why, why there is something nice about being only with men. Yeah. So the gender does... Yeah, I mean, and I, there is, there is, uh, there is significance to gender, but spending a lot of time thinking and ideating about it is less juicy than than revealing the parts of ourselves which we feel especially comfortable to do with men rather than women and not get into long analyses of well why do we feel more comfortable with that than with women i'm not averse to those analyses i I'm an intellectual guy myself. I write books. I love that. It's just that the format of a men's team isn't the best place to be having real uh, significant attention on that issue. When is a man mature? Hmm, I'd have to think about that one. I It's too complex to... And given that we've got... 
a time constraint. I, I just, it's a great question, but I'll answer it another time when we got, you know, when I can ponder it. <laughs> okay, well, how, maybe the, the, the reverse would, would be worth looking at. In a group setting, when can you say that certain behavior is immature? Well, uh, not being able to maintain rules is a form of immaturity. You know, we don't interrupt and somebody's constantly interrupting. That's a, f they're not, you know, in sort of neurological terms, one part of their brain isn't being able to control an impulsive part of their brain. And so m one aspect of maturity is being able to control impulse, impulse control, definitely, would be one strong element of of maturity and also, you know, success. There's, it's the most, I think it's the single most um, important trait for success in education, business, relationship is impulse control. Instead of telling your wife to fuck off, you or your boss or your buddy, you, you uh, control that. So, yeah, in a group, if people can't maintain Another thing is, is self-knowledge. If people, you know, say that they can commit and can't, that's a form of immaturity. Um, you know, maturity would be more like, no, I can, I'm sorry, I can't make a commitment. I, I don't, I'm not sure. And if you need a commitment, no. Uh, or, yes, I'm in. And knowing I'm in. Just knowing, self-knowledge, I guess, is critical another dimension of, of a maturity. You talk about impulse control, but if the men's group really is that safe container, then perhaps it's also the great environment to really lash out and, you know, have the guys be okay with that. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. Like, um, I, I'm not sure. I I don't know that there is a good correlation with success having members of a men's team who are not able to control themselves. Um, the concept would raise anxiety. Like, I don't know if Joe's going to be drinking and falling, you know, he's, he was drinking before he came and now he's just going to be falling asleep. I don't really like that. Or he's going to be screaming at someone. And, you know, that sort of um, volatility can undermine other people in the group that, that want to have that level of safety. And so I would say that you know, in highly structured exercises where, okay, now you can take a bat to a, to a, cur a cushion and scream and yell whatever you want, great, that's an exercise, um, that's contained. But just somebody losing control of themselves and screaming and yelling and maybe even grabbing somebody's collar, no, I don't think that's long-term viable for a group. I, I just think it'll wreck the group, guys. The sort of guys that really want to go inward and feel safe doing so are just going to go, if he's, if he's showing up to this meeting, I'm not coming, and then it'll just wreck the group. Any last uh, subject that um, you'd like to look at? But just just some really practical things like I think um, groups really need to work on a communication uh, like uh, a digital communication system, some way to communicate um, and and to have a roster of meetings. And over the years, we've experimented with different things. And uh, the the less the transaction costs to show up to a meeting to know when it is what's the more likely people are going to want to continue to attend. So um, there are various alternatives for that. Um, and uh, that was one very practical thing. What else? Um, th this is something I really don't have an answer for, but 
there's a real problem in identifying men's teams. Like, so you move to Vancouver, how do you find out where, where there are teams? And, you know, Vancouver is a bit unusual because you are here and I am here and we've both got websites that alert people to there are resources, but Vancouver is pretty unusual. And so, you know, exactly how people set up their or find a men's group when that resource doesn't exist, uh, I don't know.